Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast, where we seek progress, not perfection. Hello, and welcome back to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Today is going to be a difficult day for me. We have one of Tro's huge success stories, so Tro's going to be here gloating. And uh, I had an opportunity to talk to him for a little bit before Tro, and it, you weren't embellishing, man. This is, this is pretty amazing. It's really awesome. Robert, thank you for joining us so much. Uh, Tro, another thing for people, you have to watch Tro's little video that he put together and it shows his journey Tro, very inspiring very awesome man I, I mean i really really enjoyed it it pains me to say this but man much respect you've done an awesome job and uh so Tro, do you want to introduce robert a little bit yeah sure um i mean i i think really whenever you have someone just just like me and you brian we've uh you know done what we've been told in the past. We've, you know, count our calories, we've controlled our portions, and we haven't really found success with that way. And so whenever a patient go, explains a similar type of story, I think that hearing that story is worth telling. And Robert, you know, we know each other now for, for about a year, and what you've been through and your insight on weight on overall health and you know your experience basically with every diet i mean i think people need to hear your story and i'm so happy you've decided to share it because i think when people hear about what has worked for you in the past and what failed and you know what changed now i i think they're going to learn a lot and so thank you so much for coming it's brave to share these things i don't think people realize how hard it is to share these things so i we really appreciate you coming on and sharing these things. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone here, but I'm happy to be doing it and uh, love to share uh, whatever I can with you guys. Well, take, yeah, us so back. take us back to last February and how you got started, where your mindset was at at that point, and, and, and take us on your journey. Well, uh, actually, uh, it was in January. Uh, my brother contacted me, and he's kind of familiar with my uh, – my struggles with doctors and, and all this over the years. And uh, he had listened to uh, Human Performance Outliers podcast with Tro, uh, Tro on the, on the podcast. And he asked me to take a listen. He said, this guy's interesting. You might, uh, you might enjoy it. So uh, I listened to it and I did enjoy it. I, I liked uh, Tro's uh, uh, journey specifically and uh i thought you know he might be able to help me so i you know it took about a month i, I uh talked with my family and discussed it there was a, you know different uh elements of the decision that had to be made i took everybody into account and then february uh, uh 23rd i got started with tro and uh i have uh really loved everything that's happened since then so that's that's how i got started um, thank you to my brother for that well walk us back through kind of you know i know your struggles because we've we've talked about it and we share kind of a similar story um in fact i'd say that maybe even your struggles are much more difficult than mine so walk can you tell the people listening kind of about your relationship with your weight and food and what you've tried in the past and what's happened and Give us a sense of where you were before we met. Okay. Uh, I was a, you know, heavy baby, heavy kid. Um, uh, you know, always struggled with weight. Um, Yo-yo around when I, even in high school, uh, listed as a 300 pound, 310 pound tackle uh, in my senior football roster. Um, and, uh, you know, I lost, gained weight and lost weight between junior year and senior year. It was always up and down, always trying some different diet and uh, got married uh, four years after high school, after college, and uh, was at about 345 at that point, which is uh, 88. Um, continued gaining weight after, after getting married. Um, and. Uh, uh, again, people were concerned about me. I was concerned with it, and uh, some family tried to help out with uh, 
uh, MetaFast program, which I did. Um, uh, and I appreciate everyone who tried to help me in that way. Other family members had done it. And at that point, they had had success with it. And uh, I did it. And I got from the weight I was at down below 230. And uh, quite frankly, it was even even when I had lost all the weight, it was just miserable. I was... <laughs> I, it was, uh, you know, I went six weeks without eating any uh, food at all, just the shakes. And then they, I was losing weight too quickly, they said, and they put me on, uh, you know, two shakes and then a, a meal, a small meal at night. And I continued losing weight rapidly. And uh, the problem was at the end of that, you know, below 230, I was just... I didn't feel like myself. I didn't feel healthy at all. Everybody's telling you how great, how great you look and wow, this is a wonderful thing. And inside I'm just feeling like I don't feel like myself. I don't feel in any way like I can stay where I am. I mean, I just felt miserable and, uh, and small and, and just, just weaker than I'd ever felt in my life. And, uh, um, as soon as the doctor who uh, was running that medically supervised program made enough money so that he got a practice on the beach uh, down south and he left, they did not replace him when he left. So I was left with a nurse and, and the accountant and the nurse left about a month later and all the only guy left in the practice was uh, the accountant. Uh, and when I ran out of money, that was it. They said, Thanks a lot. And you know, you're, you're already here, so you're good to go. And, uh, my goodness, the weight began coming back on without me changing, you know, what I was eating. I, I didn't start eating crazy, but as soon as I started, stopped with the shakes and started eating food, the weight just started coming back on like, like crazy and, uh, just incredibly fast. And I, I actually went way past where I had started the diet in the next year to two years um, and got to my heaviest ever uh, as a result of that. And that was uh, uh, 525 pounds, which is hard for me to say, but that's, that's where I was. Um, and, uh, you know, I went on from there losing weight every once in a while. I, I've lost, I've lost close to in the neighborhood of 100 pounds. I have lost it. Uh, this is the, this is now the fifth time in my life that I've lost more than one or at around a hundred pounds. I'm well over that now, but uh, in the past and when I had done that, it had always been some sort of calorie restriction on, um, you know, uh, deep calorie restriction and I never felt like this is sustainable I always felt like okay, I'm coming to the end of this road because I can't eat any less than I am and then all of a sudden the weight just stops coming off it, that's how it was with me I, it, I didn't change the diet or anything I keep working hard keep the diet and it just the weight wouldn't come off anymore and uh, you know that happened a bunch of times um I never got back up as high as I was at that time, but I did, you know, kind of, if you, if you wanted to say a stabilized weight, it would be in the, uh, the area of like from 450 to 475. I was in that area for, a, for quite a bit of time before contacting uh, you. And that's when I, you know, I was at, I think 466 when I started uh, with, with you on February 23rd. You know, Brian, one of the things I wanted to <clears throat> highlight, Robert, based off <clears throat> what you said, is I don't think we discuss the pros and cons of different dietary approaches enough. You know, when people come in and they ask me, well, how can I lose weight? I list them five or six different ways. I'm sure, Brian, you do the same thing. You could try intermittent fasting. Yeah, we can do a shake for breakfast, a shake for lunch, and a sensible dinner. And then I talk about ketogenic diets. I talk about paleo diets. So we just, we give people ideas of different ways of losing weight. And when we talk about calorie restriction, I tell them, 
you know, look, everybody recognizes if you do a shake for breakfast, a shake for lunch, and a sensible dinner, yes, you will lose weight up front. But we know your metabolism will slow down. And we know at some point your body's hunger hormones are going to make this miserable for you, make it very difficult for you. We know that there's a strong pressure. Even the proponents of calorie in, calorie out, like Kevin Hall at the NIH, they talk about these pressures to regain weight as you lose weight. You know, and we see this and we know it. And I don't think we prepare people. Hey, if you want to try a shake for breakfast, a shake for lunch, and a sensible dinner, or you want to try shakes and bars, you're going to run up against an intense signal from your body to gain that weight back. Be prepared. I don't think we do that. Brian, what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, Robert, when I hear your story, I think back to Paulo. He, he, it, his story really impacted me because – it's the same as yours. He lost weight, but it was non-sustainable. He gained it all back plus some. You gained it all back plus some. So, you know, the biggest losers, we look at that experience, and I see Tro now that they're going to come out with another bigger, biggest loser. And you think, man, have they learned from the lessons of the past? No, because they want to may say, look, you lost eight, 18 pounds. You lost. So people have this expectation of losing 80 pounds the first week of keto, you know. And I think when you're saying it, and you and I had a, t- a chance to talk a little bit before, and saying, look, it's not about the weight loss. It's about how I feel. It's about my numbers. It's about my labs. It's about my joints not hurting and all those things. And we, we get so caught up in the weight loss. And that's the one thing I've learned about myself also through this journey is like, man, when my weight's stable, but I'm working out really hard, I'm putting on muscle mass, I'm, I still want that scale to go down. There's something mental about that. So Robert, tell us about how, how that affects you. I would just like to say, uh, going back to that Metafest experience of mine in, in regard to what you just said, I believe the only medical testing that was done regularly was a ketone strip. That, that was it. I would come in, uh, do a urine sample, and they would say, you know, ketones, and that, that was the only. I didn't, well, there was no focus on any other marker other than weight and just making sure you were in ketosis. And, uh, you know, by the time I got to where I am now, all of those other, I mean, I do the blood work regularly, and all of those other things are more important to me than the weight number, much more important to me. And, uh, you know, I I believe Tro would tell you I'm doing pretty well on all those scores. I know, uh, you know, what led me, my brother and I were talking quite a bit because I wouldn't talk to people about it, but I knew I was in trouble sugar wise. I had been, I'd been okay for quite a while, even as heavy as I was with the sugar numbers, but they'd started, you know, when I got to like 50, they started getting higher and out of control. And I would just check every once in a while. And I'm like, oh, man, I don't know what to do about this. And, uh, but I associated insulin with so many loved ones doing very poorly with, with that, like it not helping with, uh, you know, just, it just never made sense to me, the insulin thing. And I was, I was doing everything I could to avoid it. And I think that's why my brother, you know, pushed me in the direction that he did was because he's, he's saying, look, you got to do something and, and you have a really bad relationship with these docs. Why don't you give this guy a try? And, uh, that's, that's how I got to it, and I'm very grateful for that. Well, I, w- I want to just talk a little bit about kind of the despair you were in before you started, right? And, and you know, one of the things that I relate to so much and, and is that, look, they failed you. Our profession, Brian and my profession, doctors, they failed you time and time again. And, you know, you wrote something about that and we published it on, on, on our website, a blog piece about kind of that these doctors have basically led you, like, you've done what they've said. You've That's done correct. exactly what they've said. You calorie restricted. You ate low fat. You never, like, when we went over kind of what you ate, how you ate, it was never unhealthy. Ew. So you were in a place where you're like, I don't know who to trust, what to trust, and all of you are not helping me. I can't tell you how many times they would say to me, you need a nutritionist. And I was like, you got to stop. I don't, need, I don't need to know better what you want me to eat. I know what you want me to eat. I'm doing it. I, 
I would eat steel cut oatmeal. I would eat as whole grainy as whole grain could get. I would cut fresh fruit every single day of my life and eat it. I was doing what they were telling me to, and I was getting sicker and heavier. And it, it, eventually, I'm not saying I always ate exactly what they wanted me to, but eventually, when it's not working, you run out of patience with that. I mean, I hear you guys talking, the doctors talking about how you get burned out because the things that you're saying aren't helping patients. And, and, and that's the exact same thing that patients are feeling in reverse. We're saying, look, I'm just burned out with this. You, you're telling me this is going to work and it's not working at all. It just doesn't work. And, uh, you know, you have to do something different. And, and that's why, uh, why I came to you uh, for something different. Yeah, that's a huge point, Robert, because, you know, I was doing what we told our patients to do. We always assume that they're not listening. They're non we say they're non-compliant, but they're listening to us. They're going home, doing what we tell them to do, and they're not getting better. So we think, oh, they're sneaking food. We, we, we're calling our patients liars. We say they're, they're not listening, and everyone knows this experience. You're not exercising. You're lazy. You're watching too much TV, and, you know, it's so frustrating when you're saying, look, I'm doing what you're telling me to do, and I'm not getting better. We have to change our tact at some point. And so then, you know, that's what you did. You show up at Tro's door. So what did Tro, how did he start you out that first month? And, and uh, you know, how was that for you? How did your body react? And, and did you think he was nuts when he was telling you to eat more fat and less well, sugar and all that well, kind hold of on. stuff? Bef and, before we go there, Brian, before we go there, Robert, do you mind talking about kind of like how you were feeling, what was going on, your joints, like just before you came in, like what did it feel like, you know? Where were you? Where were you mentally? Where were you physically? Where was your health? I was at the end of my rope with doctors at all. I was on, I can't even remember the number of scripts, but it was ridiculous. And they were trying to put me on more scripts. It was just always more and more medication. And I didn't want any of it. Uh, the, the, the uh, I had AFib. And what was really the most troubling thing to me you know, I have a, I have a good life and I have uh, a wife and I have uh, four kids that I love dearly. And uh, I was heavy, very heavy, but I was always active doing all this stuff. And I was starting to lose that. I could see myself on the road to losing that mobility because I was, I mean, at the end of the day, I was literally dragging myself upstairs with my arms because my legs were so bad. And just couldn't carry the weight anymore and uh i was very very down about that and uh like i say the sugar numbers were going out of control and i was i was frightened but i didn't know what to do and i kept trying to do uh better at eating the types of foods that they tell you to eat to control your sugar and it wasn't it wasn't helping at all and i just thought i don't know i don't know what to do with this um the, uh, the heart condition led me to a cardiologist and they were literally, they were going to start me on insulin and two other medications at the time. And I said, yeah, I just didn't want to do it. And I, I contacted you and we got started. I was, they were going to start me on insulin. They had two other, there was one blood pressure medication and something else they were going to start me on in addition to the the pharmacy I was already taking on a daily basis and I just didn't want to do it. And, uh, um, starting with you and getting, making some progress on those numbers within the first month, uh, allowed me to not get started on that. And ever since then it's been deprescribing and coming off of medications and getting healthier and the, just the ability to do, the things that are important to me in life, like going to my daughter's uh, softball games and uh, all of all of the activities with all my kids, uh, that's the important thing to me. And and uh, being able to continue to do that has been, uh, you know, I can't even say how how important it is to me. So. Yeah, and if you're that successful with Tro, just think how much you would have had success if you were here in California and I had you in my hands, man. You would have been super awesome. But seriously, 140 pounds down. How how did he start you? How what did he do when you sat down there with Tro? What did he uh 
I mean, did he say we're going to eat more fat, cut out carbs? Or what was his approach with you right from the start? Well, right from the start, the first thing was I called the number that my brother had given me and Tro himself answered the phone, which that started the doctor patient relationship completely differently than you're used to right, right away. I'm already talking to Tro on the phone immediately and telling him a little bit of my story and what I'm looking for. And, uh, he didn't pressure me or anything. He just said, well, you know, yeah, I can help, help you if, if you uh, want to do a consult. And we, we started with a very long interview where I told him my history and, uh, and he, uh, you know, assessed. Um, he's very, it's very careful to assess exactly what's going on with you, which you don't ever get in a 15 minute doctor's appointment. And, uh, you know, I, I bought into that program and I, I like it. The, the doctor-patient relationship uh, is something that I've thought about a lot I, through my whole life, but especially now with this new paradigm coming into focus, uh, I, uh, it, it's, it's just really important to me. And uh, I think in order for the doctor-patient relationship to be successful, you have to have two people asking the question why when you have that initial meeting you have to have a doctor who's honestly saying why is this guy in this condition what if, if the doctor is assuming that he knows why you're in that condition and it's because you eat all the wrong foods and you then he's not talking about me tro asked questions he wanted to know why and i as the patient and this is also crucial you have to be honest about what you're going through and what you're doing you have to be asking the question why too. I had gotten to a point with doctors are su had such bad relations. I was like just using them to get the medications I needed because I didn't want to hear their advice. I didn't want to talk to the nutritionists anymore. And this thing with Tro, I was like, okay, I'm going to start again and I'm going to be honest and, and be uh, open and upfront and, and see if we can work this out. And I truly believe that if you don't have those two elements, um, both of them asking why it's not going to work. It's really just not going to work. So, um, that was important to me. Yeah, you know, that's super important. Tro, go ahead, man. One of the things that I talk to patients about, and I, and I tell them this all the time and Brian, I don't know if you could relate, but, but, you know, having been very obese, I know the the mindset, and and I talk to people about my own weaknesses, about how my wife used to hide the ice cream boxes from me because I would eat the ice cream, uh, I would eat all the ice cream bars, and maybe I'd leave one in there, and then she would hide it in the basement freezer, and then after she hide it in the basement freezer, it would go in the back of the basement freezer, and then after I'd find it and keep still eating it, she'd hide it in the freezer in the you know garage, and after I'd find it there you know, she'd, she'd hide it in another place. And, or maybe I would eat the ice cream, you know, bars and I'd, you know, leave a, a wrapper or two in there. So it didn't look as bad. Right. I tried to make it like, <laughs> look, not look as bad. You're laughing, Robert. And because, you know, or like, you know, after finishing cereal boxes and, uh, you know, everybody in the house being upset because I finished the cereal, you know, learning to just leave enough for one bowl so that people don't bother you about that, you know, right. about your app. And so, and then the other part of it, like my wife would actually come to me and say, you know, what's going on? Why are you eating so much? Are you stressed out? Are you depressed? And I wasn't stressed out and I wasn't depressed, but I would perceive her as bothering me. And here I am as a, you know, board certified internist, you know, with three kids and my, and I'm morbidly obese. And my wife is trying to help me. She's saying, what's going on? Why are you eating so much? And that I was, I was perceiving as nagging. I was perceiving as nagging. Well, that, that's addiction, true. That's so addiction exactly. Program, right? And you know what, Brian? So how do we screen people with alcoholism? We ask them, do you get agitated? when somebody asks you to cut down. And why do we ask that question? We ask that question because if you know something is not good for you, why are you doing it, right? Why are you doing it? And I didn't understand why. We, we screen alcoholics that way. And when I finally put two and two together, 
why am I perceiving my wife as nagging me? I right. realized that, wait a second, my brain, there's something wrong here. I know this is wrong and I cannot control it, right? I cannot control it. I know this is hurting me and I don't know what's going on. And so anyway, the reason why I'm bringing this up is I asked you in the beginning, I shared you all my weaknesses and here I am on my podcast sharing all, you know, our podcast sharing these weaknesses, but you shared your weakness from day one. Yeah. You shared your weaknesses and ever along the way you shared those weaknesses and we were able to troubleshoot. Like it wasn't just, Oh, I ate carbohydrates. You know, I ate that chocolate. I ate the ice cream. I ate that. It's like, why did you eat that? Did you not know you didn't have something available to you? Did you not know that you could have gone, you know, to the Wendy's McDonald's and picked up some hamburger patties? Did you not know you could have gotten a rotisserie chicken or gone to Costco and just put, you know, salmon in the oven and cooked it and ate it? You know, did you not know? Or maybe you walked into an event hungry. Like anyway, the bottom line is, it wasn't like my willpower was deficient. It was, let's figure out what happened. And you opened up and you shared that weakness. The problem is, is, we have to get more people to not be patient burnt out. Like, as you said, we have to get them to a bit reinvigorated in this process and believe that they can do it and have hope that they can do it. And you did that. So that, that's absolutely a good point. That, 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 that thing that you're looking for as doctors, that's the same thing patients are looking for in reverse. And we've got to get together and, and we have and other, other people have got to find that. Uh, my wife uh, would absolutely uh, identify with Rosette on, groceries disappearing rather quickly from, from the house and where, where did this go? Wait, I got some ice cream and it's gone. Uh, she, she can identify with that. And also I identified with your wife asking you that question because certainly my wife asked me over the years, you know, in the same way that, that your wife asked you, she's saying, Hey, look, you're an intelligent guy. What, what is going on that you can't figure this out? And and it, and she wasn't doing anything wrong. And, and I wouldn't say I thought of it in the same way that you did in, in terms of nagging, but I did think of it as I, ju I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't understand why I can't make it work. I show self-discipline. I do the things that I'm supposed to do and it doesn't work. And I, I am completely dumbfounded as to why it's not working. I don't get it. And yeah, that, that, that's why it's frustrating. I was kind of, you know, picking on someone a little bit on Twitter. I, I was taking after my friend Tro, but someone was making the point, yeah, I just uh, eat less and exercise more, eat less and exercise more. It's like, well, if you're drowning in the ocean, just breathe more oxygen and less water and you'll survive, right? I mean, you're in the middle of the ocean drowning. And that's why it's so frustrating for people. Uh, and a lot of docs in their defense have never struggled with weight. So they go, oh, I've always exercised and just ate normal stuff and I never gained weight. Yeah, you're insulin sensitive. You never allowed yourself to be 400 pounds, 500 pounds. And now we're trying to reverse that ship. And it's very, very difficult. So people confound a lot of stuff. They go, oh, you know, if you eat less calories, of course, but how do you accomplish that? We all get that point of it, right? If you're yeah. eating 10,000 calories a day, you're not going to be losing weight. But, right. you know, that whole thing uh, of, of being able to have satiety where you're not starving and miserable and you're because your body wants to survive. And it's telling you, hey, you're not eating enough. You've got to eat, right? And so you're fighting against these human instincts that we have um, no, and it's super frustrating for people and i think uh, one other thing that's an important point that we, we didn't bring up tro how come when i call you it goes directly to voicemail robert calls you and you pick up and talk to him for an hour i don't get it but <laughs> I get you in talk about that you after the show uh, but tro i know you have something burning to say here man no no i think so one of the things about helping people along the way is sharing this weakness, right? So they perceive it as weakness. I failed. I failed again. Why am I failing? And getting people not to be patients, really, not to be burned out. It's like you didn't fail. Let's figure out why you, quote unquote, failed. Let's go through that model, all the defenses maybe you weren't aware of. In healthcare, we call this the Swiss cheese model of error. We look and figure out what people, why people are failing, what they're worried about, what their concerns are. And we, we work through the defenses maybe they didn't think they had. And that's one of the things that Robert, you did really well. And you opened back up despite having been failed so many times, you opened back up and, you know, we got to work through coming kind of some of these things. So tell people what we did, you know, tell people what we did. How do we, how do we get started? I remember we did, you know, what, what do we do? 
uh, you put me into like uh, George Costanza's opposite day. I did everything different from what I'd always been told to do. I would go into my cardiologist's office and I would sit there with the don't eat salt, don't eat meat and all this, all this stuff. And I'm doing exactly the opposite and it's working. I'm eating more salt. I'm eating uh, meat. I'm eating as much as I want uh, to, I took that very seriously, the satiety thing, because my experience had always been, if you if you want to lose weight, you better cut, <laughs> you better cut down uh, all this food. And I did, I tried really hard to do what you said and just ignore the, that feeling of wanting to cut back and just eat until I was full, eat the right kinds of foods until I was full. And it was basically, you know, what you always say about, you know, meat, fish, different kinds of meat, uh, a little bit of cheese, a little bit of nuts. Uh, I was, uh, like I say, I always ate what they told me to. So I had a hard time restricting some of the side dishes that I always had had that I considered to be healthy, but I, I managed to do that. Um, uh, my wife's Sunday sauce, you gave me specific permission that I could have the homemade uh, uh, pasta sauce uh, that she that I love so much. I, I do use a lot less of it, and we're not putting it on uh, pasta anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, so I still did do a few things. Uh, I did greens every week, make greens, and, uh, you know, uh, definitely the salt thing was the biggest one. Like, I had been told you know, since I was a kid, they told me my grandmother died because of salt. And so I'd always been afraid of salt, never had used it in my life. And then when I started this, like I had that craving for salt because all the salt and all those foods were gone and I, and I needed it. And so I, I did what you asked and put salt on things and I felt better. You know, I didn't lose a lot of weight right away, but it didn't take long for, you know, the, the biggest shit, I was waiting for this. You kept talking about fat adaptation. And I was like, I have no idea what that means or how I'm going to get there. I, I didn't know what it was, but I was sitting at the Sunday dinner table with my family one day and I was eating a meal that I always would have liked. And suddenly I just was like, God, this isn't, I just need something else. And I was looking for fat. I was looking, <laughs> it was a very lean thing I was eating and I was looking for fat. And our next visit, you said, welcome to being fat adapted and that's that it was after that that the weight really started to to come off and uh and those those are the basics uh you know you told me to not worry about exercising which every other time and it always been you've got to exercise and you know when you're at 466 that's hard to do it, it's not not that i wasn't willing to do it i did it a lot of times but I would always end up with some injury. I would always end up with a huge amount of joint pain and stuff. And, and uh, you know, it, it never worked out. And then I, then I wasn't able to exercise anymore. And then I would blame that for not losing weight. It was uh, always a problem. But I did, I did what you asked me to do. The program that you asked me to do, you've got it laid out on your uh, website as well. Just I, I bought the things that you – that you said, look, these are the foods that you need to have in your kitchen. I started cooking those foods in my kitchen, you know, all, all the time. My kids uh, uh, started eating that kind of food much more. The, the whole family went much more with the real food, and everybody's liking it, and everybody's uh, doing well. Was it hard for you, Robert, emotionally cutting out those foods that were your comfort foods right away, like in, in the first month or two? Was it brutal or was, was your mind was side? I can tell you're a strong-willed guy. You put your mind to something and do it, right? Uh, I, I, think, I think that's true. I hope that's true. And I, I did not, I'll be honest, I didn't, a lot of people talk about struggling with cravings and stuff, and I didn't do that. The one thing that I didn't have that I, I kept wanting was just something that I could eat quickly that crunched I just I just wanted you know some pretzels or something that that was a thing that that bothered me at first but it was pretty much the only thing I gave up bread much more easily than I thought I would like it didn't didn't really bother me there were some cravings for for I don't know a week or two but I really didn't struggle with that I struggled with some other things but not that not the cravings and not 
What was your kryptonite before doing this stuff? What was your like go to? Like, was it sweet stuff? Was it tortillas? Was it chips? Was it crackers? Or was it everything? Well, what was your deal? Here's where I identify with you. Uh, is yeah, I would love to go to a Mexican restaurant and get that bowl of chips and salsa <laughs> and queso before the before the meal. I'd eat all kinds of calories that way. I just love that, just like you've mentioned a bunch of times. And uh, I guess the thing that, that I wasn't supposed to have that I would get hooked on every once in a while was uh, ice cream. I, I had a weakness for ice cream. And it's I like the good stuff too. So I used to work in, a, in an ice cream factory uh, when I was a kid and uh, got started on it then. And uh, also like pizza, I was a pizza chef. I worked my way through school uh, uh, at a, managing a pizza shop and uh, I learned to make pizza pretty well and I used to make that at home all the time uh, so there, those are the those are the big things that, that are so that you are around the most addictive foods on mm -hmm. earth how about yeah. french fries did you make french fries too <laughs> I, 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 no I didn't even I didn't even like french fries ever I, potatoes for me it was a uh, baked potato that, that's funny. what I that's you know, it's funny when you're talking about the, the Mexican food, because I, I would know that was my weakness. So I'd like the bag of chips would be empty and everyone's just digging crumbs off. And I'm like, I'm hoping someone's going to ask for more chips. I won't be the one to do it. But if someone does, then I'll partake. <laughs> right. So that's why I don't go to Mexican food, because it's just such an, it, you know, it's just yeah. so darn good, you know. So you yeah, I wasn't yourself. proud. I asked for that second basket of chips. I wasn't, I wasn't proud. <laughs> you know, can I, can Robert, because I think. I want to like flesh out the story a little bit. So you came in, blood pressure was high, massively, you know, really overweight and, and diabetes. They're basically asking you to take insulin. These cardiologists are asking you to take insulin. They're going to put you on more medications. And so what, what happened? Cause I, you were always, you're never really driven by weight. A lot of people come into my office and they're driven by weight, but you were like, I want to feel good. I want to get healthy. I want to get off medication safely. So talk about that because we, we used a lot of different things. We used the remote scale, the remote cuff, and the, the CGM. What did you see? What happened with your blood pressure and what happened with your blood sugar? What did you learn from these tools and these feedback mechanisms? Yeah, that's part of the new, uh, new medicine to me. It's, it's revolutionary in my mind the way – I mean, I would – these doctors would say these things to me before and it's like, we'll see you again in three months or six months. And all I did was take one little sugar test and one. And with, with you, it was, okay, I'm sending you the scale. I'm sending you the blood pressure cuff. I'm sending you, uh, the, uh, the CGM. And I learned, uh, so, so much, especially with this, with the CGM, just watching the shift, the change in that, um was incredible to me i mean it came down immediately i mean i remember the like you, i think you said like the first or second day uh after you start this i want you to stop one of the medications because you're usually you're like your blood sugar is going to drop really low and you gotta stop that that medication and it it what like it came down you know really fast and then uh also the blood pressure I would say I'm not 100% positive, but I think the blood pressure was a little bit slower, but it, but it right away was coming down as well. And and now I take it all the time still, and you're still monitoring it, even though I'm well past the initial program. Uh, I did get down. It took me a little while to get on the scale, but once I got on it, it was uh, – uh, vital information every, every day to have it and to trust that scale and know that, that you're looking at it. Uh, it's, it, it, to me, the biggest part of it is that when I, when I take these measurements, you're seeing the information. And if there's something troubling to you, you're going to contact me. The, the off, I get contacts all the time from staff. Like one time, uh, the scale, which my family also uses, somehow it switched to another family member uh, as the primary. So, so you got the information from another family member at the office and I got contacted right away. So I said, hey, this says you lost a couple hundred pounds last night and everything, everything good. And I'm, I'm like, I'll, I'll have to look into that. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. 
but it's, uh, you know, what I'm saying is the staff is right on top of all this. And that is just so different from the way that it always was in the past. It, it was like not even comparable and it's crucial. So it took a while to get on the scale. Uh, I was a little over the, the limit of the scale, but once I got on it, that was also crucial information. And uh, I like learning from the CGM. I enjoy uh, getting that feedback. Like you were, I know, Brian, you've been talking about, I'm sorry, Dr. Lenskis. Can I call you? No, Brian's fine, man. <laughs> I feel so I'm, not, I'm not like Tro where I, I have like to call him that. doctor all the time off camera. Are you kidding me? But, yeah. I go by my first name. <laughs> uh, I hear you talking about learning from the CGM, and I, I do that. I mean, I got it. I've been off of it for a couple of months just because it's hard to afford. But I, around the holiday, I wanted to learn from that CGM. I wanted to know when I eat these things, when I have this dessert on Thanksgiving, which we made a keto dessert, I want to see what the effect is of those things. And I want to see as I exercise what, what it does. Uh, I love, I love getting that information. I'm a person who can handle information if I get it. I never got very much information in the old uh, doctor-patient relationship. They never shared anything. So speaking, so, of, it, uh, speaking of information, when, when you started with Tro, do you know what your fasting insulin level was in your three-month sugar average? Uh, I know that the A1C was uh, – and, and by the way, when I started with him, I had been doing my version of dieting for about – a month at that point, a uh, little over a month. And so I, th I think, you know, it had some effect because I was trying to do low carb. I wasn't doing, you know, less than 30 carbs a day, but I was trying to do low carb. And the, in the uh, A1C was uh, somewhere around, it was just under 11, some, something like that. Uh, so it was, it was really high. Oh, and 11. 11, yeah. I think like, you know, like I say, I think it had come down a little by the time we got the reading and, and it was, I think it was like 10.76 or something like that. And 10.7. What, like what about that. the insulin, Tro? Do you remember that? I don't remember the insulin initially. Initial. I mean, I can look it up. Uh, I was just, uh, the only reason I'm curious, it, Robert, did you have a lot of swelling in your ankles and feet and stuff? Or was that not really an issue for you? I didn't have uh, like, uh, the, 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 uh, Symptoms that I was feeling was the uh, uh, neuropathy. Um, I, like I had a lot of tingling and, uh, you know, just that, that feeling of oddness in my feet. Um, I don't, I think I had a, maybe a little swelling and it's hard to tell what's, what's fat and what's swelling. I, I, I'm not sure I, I know exactly, but I mean, I was a lot bigger then, but uh, I don't think I had the kind of swelling that you're talking about with, with the, uh, with diabetes. Yeah, I just see that a lot and I see people resolve that when they drop their insulin level down. That's what I was curious about. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's just awesome what you're accomplishing. And so how about mentally during this whole journey now, you know, since February, how have you have seeds of doubt popped back in saying, hey, I blew it before. How am I going to maintain this? Or, you know, have you just been gung ho or you, how, how, how has that been mentally for you? I wouldn't describe it as gung ho. I, this is how I would describe it. I have never felt like I feel now before. Always in the past, there was a there was a there was a pressure to say, "Hey, don't you feel better? Don't you want to maintain this weight loss? Isn't don't you feel really good now?" Whereas before, you felt sick. And I would say, "Yeah, oh, of course, oh, I feel good." Even when I when I didn't. Uh, after the metafest, I felt terrible, but I was still saying, yeah, yeah, this is all good. Um, but I never once felt anything other than really, really hungry. And, and the feeling that this just is not, there's no way I can sustain this. I'm eating so little because it, the weight loss would slow and you'd cut back more and more and more to the point where you're just hungry all the time. And you're, uh, you know, you're doing everything you can to lose weight and it's just not coming off anymore. And now I feel like it, I could do this forever. And I know it's a big trope out there. This is unsustainable. I don't know what they're talking about. I mean, you give me my health back and say, you can eat all this, all this great food. Uh, you know, 
why would I not be able to do that? It was the other thing that was unsustainable. It was the uh, severe calorie restriction. And by the way, even when I was eating the things that they wanted me to, my health was getting worse and worse and worse. That's unsustainable. Uh, this is completely sustainable to me. And I've never felt that before at any point when I was losing weight. I've never felt like I could do this for the rest of my life. I absolutely feel that now. So I, there isn't negativity creeping in. There isn't, uh, and, and Tro has, has asked me about that because he wants to prepare people. So he's recently, he asked me, he's like, so what's going to happen to make you fail? What's going what's gonna to cause you to lose your, your grip on this thing? And I've, I've honestly gone over that because, like I said, I try to do what he asked me to do. Uh, I don't know anything that would make me fail at this point. There are certainly life, life events happen. There have been a lot of things. I mean, I broke a bone in my foot during this thing. You know, that, that was a challenge to get through that and still maintain everything. Lots of things happen, but nothing that makes me feel like I can't keep moving forward. And uh, I think... And I think Robert, one important point, we, we had a chance to chat a little bit before we started. And, you know, when you start talking about exercising, getting up early and exercising and how that makes you feel and all that, it was, uh, you know, I can see your eyes light up and you get excited about it because, you know, you're enjoying it. You're enjoying the journey. And I think a lot of us are saying, well, I'm not where I want to be yet, so I'm not going to enjoy it. So, hey, you right. know what? It's just making those little changes, those little things that you enjoy and say, okay, instead of having a big plate of pasta, I'll do this. Instead of sitting around all day and watching TV, I'm going to go for a little walk in the morning and it. I think it sounds like that's been part of your success is you just naturally are enjoying exercising now. Tell people about that. That's absolutely true. And, and you say little shifts going from exercising in the evening, which is what I had always done before when you're more tired, you're kind of exhausted at the end of the day, which a lot of people have to do that and more power to them. But I have recently just through circumstances, I've ended up getting up. At, you know, before 5 a.m. and I go out and, and do exercise right away in the, in the morning. Oh, what a difference it makes to what you're feeling at that point while you're exercising. But also, it just gets your day started better and you just feel more naturally energetic uh, during the day. So that was a big, big change for me. And I'm working on, uh, I've been doing 5Ks, uh, you know, and working on getting that, uh, time down I'm not running I'm, I'm not running yet i'm still walking but uh you know i think eventually i'll get to the point where i can run and uh i'm, I'm increasing uh what i do all the time and getting better and better time wise and it's it's very very encouraging like i say before i started i couldn't go up the stairs at the end of the night without it was an embarrassment how bad it was uh robert there's, there's a couple things i want to focus in on first of all it was not an embarrassment it was a result of basically the advice that they gave us i really say because i commiserate yeah. with you but you know i think one of the things that that really i knew was different about you is also you were so focused on health i mean when that when your blood sugar dropped you're like wow the power of food is real you know, when your A1C went from 11 to, I don't know what it was recently, I think it was under six, you know, yeah, off of yeah. all medications, right? Yeah. I think the power of medic you were, you quickly saw that the power food has, the food. So you, quick, you were quick to question all the previous things that you were told, right? Because you saw real-time data right in front of you. And the other things I wanted to talk about was, you know, exercise. Like now you're doing these 5Ks, but... We didn't even talk about it. I was like, don't even worry about it until you feel good. Right. right? Yes. You know, and whereas the mantra now, the Coca-Cola moderation experts, you know, they really are focusing on you have to burn more calories than you take in. And, you know, and, and instead we focused on why are you taking in so much? And the food was making you take in so much, right? The food you were eating was ca causing you to constantly be hungry. Yes. So, but the last thing that I wanted to talk about was your family because okay. they watched dad, family, wife, they all watched dad lose 150 plus pounds or about 150 pounds and now doing 5Ks. 
but I know you have personally affected your family. So talk about that just a little bit if you can. Uh, absolutely. Um, my family is uh, very important to me and none of them were, uh, I would call everybody skeptical at the start of this. They were willing to, yeah, you want to do that then go, go for it. Um, whatever you want to do. But I don't think anybody was like really fully on board at, at the beginning. And then, like you say, it's a, it's a period of time where you're adjusting to it and you're not losing much weight and you're eating things that everybody's looking at you like, wait a minute, what are you doing with that salt shaker? And what, what's with all this, this meat? And, uh, but the bottom line is after, I don't know, a few months of it, uh, my, my wife started eating that way. My son started eating that way. My youngest daughter started eating that way. Uh, I have one daughter, uh, God love her, was underweight at the beginning of this. And she, just from eating more whole foods and more real food and less of the, the crap, she's actually gained a little weight on this. And that's been very good for her. Uh, my mother and father constantly question me about well, what did Tro say about this and what did Tro say about that. They both have lost uh, a ton of weight and they're way down, I mean, uh, almost completely off insulin. And they had both been on insulin for decades. Uh, and they're now, both of them have lost just a ton of weight. I, I don't even know the numbers, but my father is uh, actually at the point where he's um, like, they're telling him, oh, you got to start gaining weight. You're, you're, getting, <laughs> you're getting too skinny. But he feels good. They're, uh, you know, mid seventies now, and they're both experiencing, you know, health uh, rejuvenation as a result of this. Um, I have a sister who's doing it. I have a brother who's doing it and everybody is making, making great progress. And, and that's, that's a wonderful thing to see. Nothing more important to me than that. And uh, it's, it's an important part of this new, uh, medical paradigm because uh, I don't I don't ever remember sharing what I did with my doctors in the past. Nobody's asking me, well, what did they give you? What are they, what do we, what, how does that affect me? Well, well, let me do that. I never got that question in the past, but everybody wants to know what's going on now, and they 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 want to do it. And that's uh, there's a compounding effect to the nature of the work that, that you do and that we've done together where it just, it, it, it moves out from, from our relationship to other people, to my family and to even friends. And I, I pray that there are other people who eventually will say, Hey, what's, what's going on that I'll be able to help someone else, um, you know, outside of the family, maybe even just, I would never force myself on them. But if, if somebody came to me and said, Hey, what did you do to, to change this? And I would, I would love to be able to, to help someone like that. I, I see this podcast thing as trying to, trying to help somebody, you know, get, get on board with this new, this new doctor patient relationship because it's, it's crucial uh, to, to the success of what you're trying to do. Uh, as a patient, you, you need that doctor. Well, let me ask you, Tro, have I been, a non-compliant patient? Do you, do you think I've been non-compliant uh, at any point in our relationship? Because um, I'll tell you this right now. You, you know, you were compliant for the last 30 years. Yeah, that's what I, yeah. You were compliant for the last 30 years. The advice was wrong. I was always compliant. I never had a doctor who believed I was compliant. And I want people to hear you say that because it's crucial. If you're out there and you're in any kind of a situation like I'm in or I was in, it's crucial that you're honest with the doctor and that the doctor is honest with you and is not making assumptions about how you got to where you are. They've got to ask that question why and figure it out and work it out together. And I really hope, you know, if you're out there and you're struggling with, with things like this, that you can 
you find this this kind of uh, this kind of a of a uh, doctor patient relationship because it's crucial to your success. The the problem is is that most of the doctors out there don't they just don't know enough, and we have to educate them. And I'm sorry, Brian, I'm going to come in here, but this is why you know we're having a conference here you know just we're there's a conference in boca raton that doug reynolds is going to put up very soon and this is going to be you know he's been doing it for the last several years and his effort to educate people physicians nutritionists personal trainers right this is what we need to do and we're working with doug and low carb usa and idm to bring that to the new york area and the new england area because we haven't had that so in january there's this you know conference in boca brian that you know unfortunately they, they asked Brian to come and I'm going to have to, you know, uh, see him over there. But, um, you they know, just brought me as your chaperone, man. <laughs> they want me to keep an idea. They, they, no then, one else would do it. They go, we'll just bring Brian in. But then, you know, part of this is educating these doctors to know what's going on and what are different approaches. Let's not just, you know, ram down the throats of everybody, more plants and more whole grains and more fruits not that there's anything wrong with that and maybe it may work for some people but there's other approaches and so not to be biased uh uh in just supporting one paradigm you know and and consider a ketogenic approach right consider a low carb approach so we're working with doug and idm to bring a conference to the new york area because i'm passionate about it we have to the re, we my profession failed you my profession failed you and i and i don't know brian how you feel about that um yeah, I think we failed a lot of people. We failed ourselves. You know, doctors don't live long. I mean, we, we die sooner than the general population. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be the experts, right? Because we have a high stress job. We don't sleep enough. We pride ourselves in eating donuts and bagels and all this kind of stuff. Well, we tell everyone else what to do. It's like, it's kind of like those guys who say no one should drive cars and they're driving their yachts all over the place and flying everywhere and saying we're killing the environment, right? So I think it's, we have to take personal responsibility. If I, if I, get on a pedestal, then I better be living that lifestyle or I better be making things to change, change the environment or save animals or whatever I, I think. I think we're hypocrites unless we do that. But I think a lot of it, Tro, is that people just don't get it. I think from a doctor's perspective, you know, we saw the HCG diet. We saw all these different things come in. And, and so really when you talk to docs, they say, well, we talk lifestyle, but we know diet doesn't work. And they're right in the classic sense because it's never worked. When you tell people you know, eat low fat and, and eat all carbs and they're gaining weight. And we think it just, no one listens rather than saying we're giving bad advice. And that's what uh, Teichold has been talking about and, and all these people. And uh, when you start doing it, someone like you, I think Tro and I could ramble on all day long, but Robert, hearing your story, that inspires me again to help people. And I think, you know, there's a lot of take home messages from this podcast, this episode in particular, because you're saying, look, my doctor cares about me. He's invested. And also, you know, there's some extent throw of like uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. When you have someone who's been through it, they could sit back and say BS. They could call the BS card because they go, look, I was hiding alcohol in my trunk too. And I know you're doing that because your numbers are better. Yeah. There, you know, when we could do that because we've been there and we understand how it is. So, you know, yeah. so if you're an alcoholic, you don't hang out at the bar, right? You're putting yourself in a situation where sooner or later you're going to have the trouble. So what you've done is changed your life around and you know, part of it's the accountability. You don't want to disappoint Tro, who's invested in you. And you have accountability because if you know he's going to be weighing you in tomorrow, you're not going to go out and have that extra whatever tonight, right? So right. I think all these things are so critical that we don't, we're, we're thinking about, yeah, just cut the calories. But like you were saying, it's like, okay, that's nice. I've been trying that for 30 years and it's not working. And I don't need you to send me someone else to tell me the same advice. I mean, that's where we've lost our minds in medicine. That's why it's frustrating especially hearing your story, because clearly you could do Metafast and lose a bunch of weight, but then your body said, no way, I'm going to hold on to this and you gain it all back. And you could do right. this and you could do all these different box programs, but it's non-sustainable. So that's why someone like you who's been doing it for a year, Tro who's maintained for all this time, my weight's been stable for you know a long time, for three years. I've never maintained weight loss that long. And so I think for a lot of us, when they say it's unsustainable, it's, it's coming from a position of being uneducated because- yeah clearly story after story after story we're hearing that this is sustainable once you change but if you're saying okay i'm gonna lose 150 pounds and i'm going back to what i was doing before that's going to put you back in the same boat again of course we all right. anyone with common sense knows that so i think there's so many super important take-home messages from what your story robert and, I, and i'm telling you right now you are going to inspire a lot of people i know a lot of my patients come in and go oh i heard that this episode with this patient this guy was 679 pound jeff right and you right. hear their stories and it gives you hope that, that you know, there is hope. And 
to say when you're you know over 500 pounds just exercise more is absolutely ridiculous right yeah uh, because it's hard to do how are you going to exercise when you can't stand up i mean you know you got to you got to take some of that weight off so that you can be functional and, and you're kind of saying the same thing now you just naturally are exercising right because before it would be torture because you're hurting all the time absolutely i uh i want to say one thing with doc Dr. Tro before said uh, that I had realized the power of food to change this situation in my life. And I, I agree with that. But what I want to say is I had, I had bought into that previously and I was trying to eat the diet that they said, this diet will help you control your sugar. And it wasn't working. But unfortunately what I've learned in my life with doctors is that there are some docs out there who will beat a dead horse until you are buried right there alongside of it. They just won't change their ideas. And uh, I think, you know, another aspect of this new paradigm that I'm talking about is we can educate ourselves. We, there's, there's, uh, you know, when I'm talking about growing up in the 70s, there was much less information out there now i can listen to the low carb md podcast and i can hear uh, dr syphus and i can hear dr ali and i can hear Dr. bickman and i i can pay attention to them and then i can go from that to other podcasts and i can go to uh youtube and i can learn all about these things and so while i don't believe that makes me uh you know i haven't earned a degree I don't have a right to argue with a professional who, who has, but, but I'll tell you what I have done. I've earned the right to ask intelligent questions when Dr. Caveman grunts LDL bad at me. You know, I've learned something and I get to ask you a question and you don't get to just say, hey, I don't want to hear from you. LDL is bad. You can't do that. You got to do this instead. You know, it's it's a more complicated situation than that. That's that's what I've learned, and that's what uh, I've learned with Tro. And uh, Tro's always open to different ideas. That's what bothers me is they're always like, "Oh, you're so close-minded. You only only do this one thing." That's just not true. It's the it's the other side that's very close-minded. Yeah, it's, you can't. Do you wouldn't this. know it from Twitter, but Tro's a reasonable guy. It, absolutely. At times, at times, we catch him at moments. Mm -hmm. That's why we do podcasts really early in the morning before he gets his, <laughs> before he gets too uh, ornery. What's that word? Ornery? Is that the word? Yeah. Ornery. Yeah. So Robert, man, it's awesome. You know, everything you're saying is super helpful. Helpful to me, helpful for, for us docs. And I think, you know, diet doctors doing a great job. They're going to do some free CME, uh, medical education stuff for docs. Even if you're a doc who doesn't say, okay, this is all, I'm all in on this thing, at least being educated because it's not going away. No matter what people say, this is not going away. Your story, people's stories like yours, um, you know, it, it's not going away. So I think we're, we're just at that point where we're at a tipping point where the standard of care will change. And, uh, you know, we, just when you say your A1C goes from 11 to under six is just the, the implications for those of us who know are just staggering, you know, I mean, unbelievable decrease in cardiovascular risk and all this stuff. So people are going to have to start understanding how huge that is while tapering medications. You know, I could put you on a ton of meds and bring your A1C down, but I'm making you sicker. And till that paradigm changes where we're happy about looking at lower numbers without looking at the, the whole being and you, and, and you know what I'm saying? Cause you're yes. depleting yeah. your sugar. You're not hiding it somewhere. You're getting rid of that dang stuff by not putting it in your body and burning it off by exercising. So I think right. it's a huge deal. And, and you know, it's very inspiring your story. And I know you have some words of wisdom you want to leave us with. So oh, let I us know about that, man. What your, what your big thing is that. you want to tell people. I just, uh, I, I've said most of what I wanted to say. I just, uh, I wanted to mention a struggle that I have and I'm wondering if people associate with this and, and that is uh, through all those decades of all the uh, weight struggles, um, the the uh, the skill set that you develop in that it, it seems to me is more about endurance. You're you're enduring this bad advice, and you're enduring pain, and you're enduring uh, uh, you know just terrible health, and it's getting worse all the time. And you have to keep getting up and trying again. And that's a wonderful uh, skill set to have. It really is. It's important. 
but uh, what I've been, I'm struggling right now, and I, I use that word in the, the best sense of that word, is to stop enduring and start, and start living and start, you know, thriving with the new, changing your ideas about I don't want to endure. If there's a problem, I want to, I want to get after it and solve it. I don't want to just endure it anymore. And I hope that there's someone out there that, that knows what I'm talking about with that, that, that sees like you've, you've just spent all this time enduring, you know, you're living your life and I have a wonderful life. I'm very happy with it, but there was this element of it that just, I couldn't control no matter what I did and just was trying to get through. And, and now I have to, have to change that idea in my head. It has to go away and I have to, to really start going after things and, and enjoying the life that I've, uh, I've found. So, and I appreciate uh, you. I appreciate you guys more than I can say. I've, I've learned so much from this podcast that you guys do, you know, just on the side of your practices and from Tro's work with me in the practice and uh, very, very appreciative. And my family would also like to express their appreciation to you. So how, how much is your whole family down? I'm just curious and wait. I mean, not that weight is like the end all be all, but I'm just curious, you know, it's uh, I know for sure that it's over uh, 300 pounds. I, I don't know the exact number. It, fluct it fluctuates, but know for sure that it's under over 300 pounds between me and you know mom and dad and sister and brother and my that's awesome kids. that's awesome but we you know we did have to add a little for that one daughter that was on the road. so we lose a little bit with her but she was nutritionally healthy see look bro look how much more luggage they could take on the airplane now and it will be the same way they could take all like 12 we bags start each. charging the airlines for yeah, our yeah services. charge them say we're saving you baggage space guys look so, so man, I, never, awesome. I never had the seatbelt experience because I didn't fly, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't get on a plane. So I never had that seatbelt experience in common with you, but oh, it's not I'm, a good feeling. Not a good feeling. I'll tell you I'm that. I really, really flying really like now. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah, no, I'm excited about your future, Robert. Your, your, your brain's right. You're on the right track. And even with throw, you're doing a great job, man. So <laughs> So you, know, you guys all make Tro look good. It just so I'm gonna get some of my people on Tro. I got a couple that Tro fills up all of our schedules, so I can't put my patients on. But oh. <laughs> but it's worth it, man. No, seriously, I, I'm 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 all respect. You know, it's it's your journey is gonna inspire a lot of people. And you know what Tro is doing is, is the right thing, helping you getting. You know, when you know someone's in your corner, you're just gonna do better. That's just the way it is. And and you know the other thing, Robert that I love that, gosh, I wish a lot of my patients were more like, cause I have people that I give them a bunch of resources. Then they come back three months later and go, what was that thing you told me? But you jump in and you're, you're learning and you have a passion and a desire to do that. And through that, you're going to help a lot of people because you know what you're talking about. You know, I mean, how many doctors out there listening have a patient drop their A1C from 11 to five or, you know, in the five range. Yeah. Uh, tape, that, that in itself is just astounding. I mean, you know, 140, 150 pounds of weight loss is massive, but that change of A1C is just, just unbelievable about your longevity. And plus, again, the healthcare system is crumbling. If you didn't change what you were doing, you'd be, you know, facing dialysis amputations. We know where, where you were going. You, by the way, just one quick, how about the neuropathy? Has it changed or you still have it? You know, I was paying attention to that. Uh, what is it? Was it Brenda Zorn? Yes. Uh, it's something about three, three years for the neuropathy. I, I've noticed the neuropathy getting better, but listening to that, I didn't think there was that long of a timeline. On it. So I kind of thought, well, I'm probably going to have to live with this. But if she's saying three years, uh, you know, I've got some time to go where I can maybe – see more improvement on that. I would really like it. All right, man. We'll follow up with you on that. Tro, man, do you have any words of wisdom? Yeah, I think the last thing I want to say is ultimately what I told Robert in the beginning was you could, you know, I don't want you to trust me like you trusted everybody else. I want you to verify. I want you to verify with the CGM, the blood pressure cuff, the scale, how you feel, your hunger. I want you to trust me and trust my advice because I've been doing this and I, yeah, I got, you know, certified and, you know, and yeah, I'm, I've been through it, but I don't want, I don't want to be that, you know, that zealot either. So yeah, trust me. Great. My advice right. works, but now I give you the power. Here's your cuff. Here's your scale. Here's your CGM. You tell me your hunger all along the way. We'll check your labs. You tell me if you're happy with what's going on. And that's, right. 
that's a big difference, I think, is, yeah, trust me, but you're going to verify me. And yeah. if it's not going the right way, if the numbers don't look good, we're going to reevaluate it. Maybe I need, maybe in three years, you know, we're going to tell you to do another, another diet. But at right. least you're verifying me in the whole way. And I think that's another part of this paradigm, Brian. Yeah, like, yeah I absolutely, I, true, 100%. Because I think, you know, I think we debate people and we argue, is protein good, is protein bad? But I think it may depend where you are metabolically. As you get metabolically healthier, your diet can change. So it's not like, okay, the rest of your life you could only do this. Because you may be able to introduce more carbs in later. You may be able to add more protein. You may be able to cut down the fat. So I think that's what people have to realize is, is our advice is not, lifelong say okay what you're doing now because if you plateau out or you start gaining weight we got to change something and, and I, as long as we're scientists we have to change variables until it works instead of saying well just keep doing the same thing because if tro right. told you you know you plateau or gain weight you keep doing the same thing you just like wait a minute it's not working doc right you lose confidence so i yeah. think there's times when we're gonna naturally plateau it just happens it's not that you're doing anything wrong but your body is changing and its energy sources and all that stuff but those are all super critical points and and everyone i know we ran over a bit but this story is super important. Robert, very inspiring. I'm inspired. And I think um, there's so many take home messages about relationship with docs, with, with, uh, you know, our mindset and how we do these things. And, and so Robert, it, it, the reason we started this podcast is because of people like you really, because we wanted to get the, the common guy out there who's not, doesn't have a medical degree. Cause we, we throw around, someone will make a brilliant point. They go, well, go get a medical degree degree and come back and talk to me then. Right. But the point is still right. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I can't stand that arrogance that we see, but, but the point is when you go, look, I've lost 150 pounds, like Tro, these guys argue with Tro. They've never had weight struggles. He loses all this weight, has a huge inspiring story. And they go, what do you know about weight loss? Well, I've done it. Right. So you got some credibility. There's not like he's just thinking of theoretical stuff. This is real life. And by the impact he's having on you and your family and your family's going to impact your neighbors and your neighbors are going to impact the community. And so that's what we're talking about. That's why this podcast is powerful in a way that we kind of never really anticipated, Dro, that we're reaching people like you and you're like, Hey, I'm listening. We help keep you on track and, and you're focusing on good stuff. And you know, that's why we do it. I think people always say, well, they're making money. We, we, we've lost money doing this podcast, but, but your story, man, I get goosebumps like five times while we're talking because it's so powerful story because we know the implications. So anyways, Oh, I'm making a long story longer, but Tro, <laughs> do you want to close this, man? Bottom line, thank you for sharing your story, Robert. I know uh, you've had uh, reservations about it. And I know it's difficult to talk about, you know, these issues and, you know, and I appreciate your willingness to share your weakness with me and, and the whole community really, because people are going to listen just like your family has gotten you know, uh, their health has improved, right? You're going to, I think, you know, improve the health of a lot of people that you won't even know. And you're going to encourage people you won't even know. So I really thank you for coming on. Well, you guys Robert, are doing that you every so much, day. Man. You guys are doing that every day. And I thank you very much for the, uh, the opportunity. Appreciate it. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for your support, for keeping us going. We're hearing great stories. And and uh, thank you so much for the all the iTunes uh props and, and uh, reviews. We greatly appreciate that. And, and for the support on Patreon, you know, we really, really appreciate it. You've uh, helped us just to not have to um, take outside funding and to keep us going. So Tro, what do you have to say, man? Thank you for listening to the Low Carb MD podcast. We really appreciate every single positive feedback, all the comments, all our listeners, everybody on Patreon who supported us. You guys have kept us commercial free without bias and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you. And if you haven't had time yet, please take a minute and just uh, click a, a review and um, again, uh, share this with your friends and family. We appreciate it. And we're over a million downloads, believe it or not, Tro. This is super awesome. So thank you all for listening. You are greatly appreciated.